maybe they were in a um, little bit of truancy trouble. Uh, maybe they were below grade level, but not special ed enough. Those were the kids that were targeted. And in the interview for that job, they asked if I would, the principal asked if I would go take this class called Brain Gym. It was a 24 hour, three day class that was over a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And my answer to his question was that I would learn to coach football if he gave me the job. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I got the position and by the third day I came home sobbing because the seventh and eighth graders were punching holes in my little mobile unit walls and they were aggressive. They were not able to focus. They were moving all the time. There was constant chaos and an extraordinary lack of harmony in the classroom. Three weeks into the year, I went and took this class um, that taught me more about the brain than any college class that I had had back then. And it, it taught me that the kids, that the children, we're not really making an effort to make my day miserable. <laughs> they were doing the best they could with what they had access to inside their brains. So I brought these movements back to my classroom out of a sheer place of desperation. And the very first day I saw a difference in those students they were able to sit for minutes instead of seconds and complete some of their work. They were able to answer questions that I had without having this defense um, reaction automatically coming at me as their teacher. And at, I used these exercises, these movements for myself because I found that they helped my own nervous system so that I could be a better teacher. At the end of that year, my students, I, I, I taught writing. And at the end of that year, these at-risk students had doubled and tripled their writing test scores. We, we had some of the highest writing test scores in the entire school. And so I jumped on the bandwagon for um, really learning everything I could. And that was over 220, 230 schools ago that I've been to. Um, I've been to the Ukraine and worked in orphanages there. I work um, some from the Marines and the Army working with PTSD with the soldiers and their families when they come back from war. And I also work just one-on-one -on -one with children who need to learn movements and skills and self-regulation for being able to sit and read a book. Um, there, there are many, many physical components that have to happen in order for us to focus. And so I, I work with those too. Um, so just to kind of do a little lead in, I, I thought I'd ask a few questions because I know um, we've got a buffet of backgrounds. I know there might be some teachers, but also business owners and parents and, and folks. So what do we know about our bodies when we go into a stress response? Would you share with me what happens to you? And so if y'all y'all can either take off your mute and jump in, or you can type it in chat and I'll read it out loud. So um, the question is, what are some of the things that we feel when we go or under stress? So if you yeah, could what happens to in. our bodies? So blood, so here's some answers. Blood pressure rises, body tenses up, muscle tightening or tension, accelerated heart rate. Yes, yes, yeah, and absolutely uncontrolled anxious movements. Face gets red, yes. So what you just described is reactions that our autonomic nervous system has. And so our nervous system has two parts to it. Does anybody know um, what those parts might be or one of them? Um, 
automatic, yep. parasympathetic. Good, good, good. good. Okay, limbic, the limbic system is part of um, the upper part of the brain, which we'll talk about here in a minute. You've got your parasympathetic and your sympathetic. And the parasympathetic we call the rest and digest area of the brain. Yes. And the sympathetic is more of the fight or flight response. It's how we get aroused. It's where the anxiety comes from. And whenever we have these, these things that happen in our systems, it's because that sympathetic is getting more fire than the parasympathetic. Now, the parasympathetic can also be a stress response too. Um, does anybody have any ideas of how that happens? How do we get the parasympathetic too active? You have this with students. I'm sorry. That was my um, school announcement about faculty lunch. So sorry. Okay. No, no, Hopefully no worries. That'll be the last one. But so the no question worries. is, if you do mind you repeat it, Becky, for me. Not at all. The parasympathetic can also be thrown out of balance. And so the parasympathetic, actually the freeze response is also part of the sympathetic. Um, the parasympathetic is more of a depressive state where we want to rest all the time and we don't have enough motivation. And so we rest and we eat for emotional um, soothing. And so what Brain Gym does is it brings these two areas of the autonomic nervous system into more balance. So if we could touch the back of our head, we're touching an area back here that is the brainstem. And the brainstem is where the autonomic nervous system becomes regulated. And right above that is your cerebellum. Now the cerebellum holds 10 to the 20th power more neurological connections than any other area of the brain. When we take a little piece and sliver of that off and we look at it under a microscope, it looks like a super highway in Atlanta. I'm actually in Atlanta right now working um, with a family. And then the, the neocortex, the frontal lobes, when we take a little sliver of that, it looks more like um, your Highway 321 or your 105 extension or Highway 221 going into Ashe County. Um, the cerebellum area is where our motor and development and developmental reflexes are formed the first formative years of life. So that's what Brain Gym works with. It, it backs up in order to build that cerebellum to have a stronger foundation so that these other areas of the brain that we're getting ready to talk about are able to be formed optimally. Does that make sense? It's like creating a stronger foundation. Um, so the limbic system popped up as an answer. That's definitely something that we talk about. What does anyone know about the limbic area of the brain? If you take your tongue and you press it to the roof of your mouth, you were to puncture there, that would be your limbic system. It's the primary area of development from 18 months until about five. So think about what do our 18 month olds do and what from 18 months to about five, what's the primary things that these, that these little people do? That's what our limbic system does. Anybody wanna chime in there? Temper tantrums, these are from chat. Temper tantrums um, has to do with taste and touch. Um, okay. I know from training this with school systems and because it's one of my areas of weakness, um, it's the big emotional reactions like um, anger and explosion or crying or some of those things. Um, somebody else said putting everything in their mouth. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a rooting, that's actually a rooting reflex. Yes. Yeah. So those extreme emotions are, are kind of what happened in the limbic system. Yes. So there's an area in the limbic system that's known as the amygdala. 
and that amygdala takes in 20,000. Would you show that? I love that. Would you show this that? This is what we train at school. So this is the amygdala and it lives in that limbic system and kind of helps us control and regulate our emotions. And when everything's right, then the thinking part of our brain is online and on track. But when it's thrown off, and that's activated. So this is what we teach kids right now is the hand brain model, hand model of the brain. And we have them say amygdala because it's such a key component and it's so much fun to say. So when that's all calm, then your brain's online and thinking. Yeah, and the, the other thing I like about this and this model is that when the amygdala feels safe, the, the fingers are down. When it's up like this, it's in this fight or flight reactive place and we're not able to think. Um, all the blood rushes to survival and we're prepared usually to fight or to run uh, or yeah, to fight or to run. And someone mentioned freeze. Now the freeze area of the brain is even a lower part of the brain where you can't even access the ability to, to run or to fight um, where everything shuts down. Um, there's a wonderful model by Dr. Paul McLean. You might want to look him up. Uh, it's, it's the model that Brain Gym uses in regard to teaching um, a pretty simple model, but also thorough. And he talks about the reptilian part of the brain being the fight, flight, or freeze response. And the limbic system being an emotional mammalian response, and then the neocortex being more of our ability to critically think, our ability to answer questions, and our ability to move forward, which isn't able to happen unless we're getting physical things happening here. This is, this is what I wanna move into now. So what physically has to happen in order for our neocortex, the front part of our brain, to be firing. Would anybody like to share what they think, what physically has to happen in the physiology of the system? After we've been sitting now for about 15 or 20 minutes, after 15 or 20 minutes of sitting, all of these physical things begin to slow down. How many of you have trouble paying attention after 15 or 20 minutes? It's hard to get yourself to focus for longer. We're going to do something in just a few minutes to help us with that. Does anyone want to share what they think physically has to happen in order for the brain to fire? Yeah, it has to be movement. So movement does some things. What does movement do physically? Okay. It's pumps cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, cerebrospinal fluid is, yes, blood flow. Yes, we have to get blood flow. We have to get cerebrospinal fluid flowing. We have to get glucose and oxygen. And water is key as well, because water is a conductor of what? Glucose? Um, electricity. It conducts electricity, and that's how the brain works. So, would you like to create for me to create a little experience here so that we can um, play with this? Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to invite, I know that most of you, now we've been sitting for almost 20 minutes. I'd like to invite that you see if there's any stress in your eyes when you look up. Just notice if there's any pulling. Because the visual system, we use our visual systems way too much. It's way out of balance in this country. And now look down and see if there's any pulling when you look down. Notice if you're holding your breath, please. And then to the left. And then to the right and just see if there's any pulling. The other thing I'd like for you to do is just track your finger in the motion of reading from right to left 
and notice how easily or how challenged your eyes feel when you do this check. Okay. And so now we're going to do a few things. So just take that little inventory of what that was like. Oh, let's do one more. Just check your neck from side to side. And if everybody can just double check that they're muted, please. So we're not having background noise. Thank you. See if you notice any pulling in your neck muscles. Because keep in mind, in order for this circulatory system to work, Everything has to pump vertically and then back down. And so muscles that are constricted inhibit the flow of that circulation. It inhibits the flow of the oxygen. It inhibits the flow of the glucose in the cerebrospinal fluid. So the first one I'd like to show you is called balance buttons. We're going to take three fingers and just place the three fingers at the base of the skull, right up underneath. You can put some pressure here. You're just going to hold. And what I'm going to invite you to do is you could do circles while you blink. You could also do a lazy H, otherwise known as the infinity, which helps the visual system to cross the visual midline, which is not always easy, especially for little people who haven't crawled or experienced the ability to cross the midline, the physical midline. You could also create an eight that's vertical with this and not just horizontal. Create a clover leaf. Perfect. And now I'd like to show you something for your neck. So you take your thumb and you put it in the front and the four fingers go in the back. So you're going to grip your, your deltoid and your trapezius, but it's not quite so close to your neck. You'll want to cross over to hold the opposite shoulder. Holding the opposite shoulder is easier than holding the same shoulder. Okay. There you go. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> We're all learning. So you, you grip here firmly, but like not enough to make yourself have tears in your eyes. And then you go all the way to one side and we take three breaths in and out. Everything we do resets muscles. We work with the origin and the insertion of the muscle, which is where it receives the message from the brain to release it or to keep it contracted or constricted. After three breaths, keep holding and rotate all the way to the other side. And then keep holding and we'll rotate again all the way to the other side. And now on this last part, take your chin down to your chest and take the arm where you're holding that trapezius and that deltoid and just kind of move it around. You could do large circles. You could do an eight just to release and reset those muscles. Perfect. So Compare the two sides, and would anyone be willing to share what you notice? And it's okay if you don't notice anything, but if you do, would you be willing to share what you notice about the shoulder that you worked with and the one that you didn't? My shoulders dropped down. My left shoulder Good. dropped down, yeah. And the Great. comments in the chat are, it's looser. The side I focused on is much looser. It's so much more relaxed. 
more relaxed. So all the okay, comments. Okay, it tingles. <laughs> tingles, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so now I'm going to have you do, I'm going to add an emotional component here. Um, oftentimes our shoulders get up like this because why do we do this? What are we doing in the world? Protection. <laughs> we're protecting, we're carrying everything. Stress. And we're stressing. Very good. All of that. And so when you do this gentle reset, because you really are re-educating muscles here, you're beginning retraining your body. And that's what we want to do. So we've all trained ourselves to do this stress response. And that's okay. Everything that I teach and everything that I do is about being gentle with ourselves. There's no bull whip out with any of this. Um, we're going to do a few things here in a moment that might be even challenging. Um, and the challenging part is a gift because it's teaching you something about yourself. And my goal today is that you leave here with something that you can actually use for yourself. So let's go and do the other side so that we don't leave one side relaxed and the side that we haven't done constricted. So you're going to grip with the thumb and then the four fingers go in the back. And then you rotate your head, three breaths in and out. Remember, it takes eight to 15 seconds for the muscle to reset. And when you're ready, you can turn all the way to the other side. Um, I see a couple of you leading with your eyes, and that's really good because the eye muscles connect to the neck muscles. The eye muscles are stressed. The likelihood of your neck muscles being stressed are as well. And then we do one more repetition so that we're doing a minimum of three. And then we drop our chins down to our chest and we move that arm in circles that we're holding the trapezius and the deltoid muscle. Okay, great. So now I'm going to invite us all to stand up because I want you to do a little experiment, not to mention get up out of your seats because you may be tired of sitting. And you don't have to. I just want to invite folks to stand up. So when I bring my right arm and my right leg up and down at the same time, which side of my brain? am I using? You got it. Left. So if I bring my left arm and my left leg up and down, I'm, also, I'm using the right. So just do a few of these rotating from side to side and just notice how this one-sided movement feels to you when you do it. And then I'm going to invite that you compare it to what we call in brain gym a cross crawl. So you take the left hand and you touch the right leg. And then you take the right hand and you touch the left leg. Now with this cross lateral movement, which side am I using? Both. We're using both, yes. And not only are we using both, but we're firing across a band of nerve fibers called the corpus callosum. Does anybody know what that corpus callosum is or what it does in the brain? I just told you it was a band of nerve fibers. 
It's responsible for connecting the left and the right hemispheres. Children who have not crawled and who have not gone through certain developmental reflexes do not create a blueprint for language, okay? Language operates many times in both hemispheres. And so what does crossing the midline visually have to do with reading? When we cross this midline, as I'm having you do this tracking, and we did the lazy eight as you held what we call balance buttons, what does this move have to do with the simple act of reading a page? Yes, it's a tracking from left to right. When the eyes don't work as a team, which is called convergence, which gives them the ability to focus on one word at a time, then children do not have the optimum ability to read. And a teacher's frustration can be off the charts. I, I taught in my own classroom for four years in middle school and then have been in hundreds of classrooms just in different schools because part of what I would do is go in and model how to use the exercises with large groups because this is an issue that many, many children and many grown-ups also have too and it creates a lot of visual stress. So what I'd like to offer is if you would go back and look up with your eyes after just those few things and see if you notice a difference now in your range or in what you noticed is pulling. Do you notice anything there? Does anybody feel a difference in the pulling when you look down or to the right and to the left? There's less <laughs> pulling, it's not as painful. Less, awesome. less tight, less tension, less pulling, okay. feels more relaxed. Have you finished that war assignment? Somebody is, if you can be sure you're on mute, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, so Yolanda typed pretty amazing. I'm sitting here trying not to like, Whoa! angel singing, because that is, it's, it is amazing. <laughs> well, it gives you some tools. So let's, let's do this. Check your neck and go from side to side. And does anyone notice anything about your neck and the muscles in your neck? There's a smile in the chat. <laughs> good, 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 good. Much less tense, good. someone said. Good, okay. I would like to show you another move for the visual system um, because again, with having to use computers so much more, um, the visual systems are so, oh good, less cracking and popping, love that. Oh, your headache, definitely these things are great for headaches. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, is a lazy eight? So let's learn this one, and then I'm going to open it up to some questions. Um, I've got lots of other things we could, we could explore, different areas of the brain, other movements, but I want to stop and see if there are any questions um, after we learn the Lazy Eight. So the Lazy Eight looks like an infinity. We call it a Lazy Eight because it's on its side. And the reason that we use it a lot, it, it was actually used in special ed classes back in the 60s. And what it does is you start in, at the center of your nose and you go very slowly as you track this age as best you can in the air. For, for small children, I normally put it on a piece of paper and I have them track the eight on a piece of paper with a pencil. You could do um, sand in maybe a little baking pan or outside. But just notice, like even when I come up to the left today, there's more pulling when I go up to the left in that direction. 
just keep going in that direction until it it gives a little and also be aware of your breathing reflexes to hold our breath when we do something new so and everybody make sure you're on mute too please yeah and then switch to the other hand because we want to fire in both hemispheres and so becky i just have to jump in and say you and i were doing this before the call started and then I had yeah. no problem doing this with my dominant hand whatsoever. And when you told me to switch to my left hand, I literally, I couldn't do that. Like I literally could not, my thumb sent a message to my brain saying, I don't know how to move in that rhythm. And it took us okay. a few minutes and you, you said, just take your time and be yeah. patient. But it literally took about eight of those patterns before my thumb and my brain started feeling like that was something that they could competently do. That just blew my mind that I had no problem with my right hand and that my left hand was struggling. So, Yes. Well, now your left hand has the ability to cross that midline. And so that there's firing in your right hemisphere. And uh, that's what that means. And that's normal when we use our dominant hand more than the non-dominant, but everything that we do in this system of movement, it's both sides working because optimally we want to function at a 51% dominance and a 49% partner. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, to just yeah. access our greatest potential. So is it okay now to open up to questions? Got about, 20 some minutes left and yeah so Becky is really interactive I don't know if you're on at the beginning but she this is the first time she's ever done zoom and she's usually in person with people doing a lot of movement and conversation so if you have any questions um, or comments that's how she's used to operating so she welcomes you can unmute yourself and just make comments or you're welcome to type it in and I'll read it to her one thing that well, also, occurs, go ahead. Well, I just thought also, it, if there's something else that you want to leave with, like if you have specific um, people or diagnoses or um, things that you're curious about, please. So one question uh, was, can they just look up Brain Gym, do a Google search on Brain Gym to find out more about this or how can they learn more? Well, what I I would love to offer doing a face-to-face -face little one or two hour thing for folks who are interested past year, because I will tell you, um, being a public school teacher and all the experience that I have, these things are very specific. And when you look something up online, you miss the details. Then there are a myriad of details with them. Um, you can kind of hear my instruction like, it takes eight to 15 seconds to reset these muscles. It takes the origin insertion of the muscle for the reset to happen. These are things that you can miss. You can certainly look brain gym up. There, there are lots of books that you can buy. Um, I encourage the interaction in a group because of the details and the specifics and creating new experiences that, um, begin that growth of your new neurons. I mean, that's what you're doing. What we are building new dendrites that look like little ticks that, that grow from neuron to neuron when you do these movements. And my goal is that you create a new pattern in your system. So when that amygdala takes in information that your brain reroutes to the neocortex instead of that stress response where your shoulders go up and you can't think and you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Um, but it's a training process. So yes, you can look it up, but I invite face-to-face um, -face for folks who are interested to. And so one question in the chat was, when do we use the lazy aids? Is that any time or during a, is there a particular situation or circumstance that that's more helpful for? Is there a particular time to do it? Um, great question. I 150% use the Lazy 8 myself when I have a lot of reading to do. 
I use it every half hour. For my students, um, I create and I have a sheet that's created that has a large eight on it. And we even place the alphabet letters on it because this does miracles for students who transpose their letters. It will, it will correct that transposition. Um, I had a principal, gosh, it was years ago. It was back when I was in my 20s. Um, cause I've done this work for 26 years. I think I was maybe 24 and I got a call from one of the principals in Ash County. And he said that he had a student who he was going to hold back. And could I do something with him this summer that would make him able to read well enough to be promoted to the third grade? Well, his mother brought him every week and he learned new exercises Every time I would put a pencil in his hand, he would flip those letters. But we were, we were building a garden outside. And so I took him out there and had him feel with the dirt, the right side and the left side, both sides, because the alphabet letter A goes on the left, but the alphabet letter B goes on the right. And it's the discernment of right and left and the ability to cross that midline and the ability to feel it. The tactile ability to feel it takes it to a deeper level of understanding. So what I did is I had this little boy, his name was Tyler, do these letters. At the end of 14, two, two to three weeks, he was no longer transposing letters and he was promoted into the third grade. I have stories like that where teachers have learned and they take it back to their kindergarten class and they say, oh, this is the first year that none of my students have uh, transposed a letter going into the first grade or going into the second grade. Um, I have a, the teacher here. This is the homeschool where I am now in Atlanta. It's a, a private family. The teacher at the homeschool uh, she does the lazy eight when she needs to get more settled herself and centered. Um, so anytime, but definitely for reading and writing. I see some questions. On that. I've got feedback on my machine. Then there's a question about where can we go to learn more about this? And I know from talking with you, Becky, that you actually have like a certification or whatever yeah. the term would be in this type of intervention. And so that's something that somebody could pursue. But um, if they wanted to just talk to you a little bit more, they could talk to sure. you. They can just, they can just call, call me and um, call me or email me. I would be happy to share. And mm -hmm. the, another question was, are there therapists in Watauga or Caldwell County that do this? You're the only person I know. I mean, I know I'm the only one. Go ahead. That I know that's licensed. Yeah. Licensed is the word. So mm -hmm. I've heard of teachers going and getting, so I think there's trainings around where you can go and kind of get a little taste of this and maybe get some technique. Cause you've taught us things here that we can leave and go with us and do with our own children or ourselves. So you can probably go and do some professional development in this and get a little bit of it, but you could also, it's as extensive as being licensed in it as well. Yeah, the way I typically do it is, depending on interest, is I start with little hour things. And the actual 24-hour training is a class that I'm able to teach. Um, that's one of the classes that my license enables me to, to do. The license also enables me to work out. I saw the question about the, the veterans. And, and they're not all veterans. Some of them are still enlisted. Um, who still go to Iraq or Afghanistan and just have trauma from the auditory noise. Um, even if they're not direct combat, the, the auditory over stimulation is traumatic. And so when, it, when they come home and a door is slammed, they go into a Mara reflex, which is a startle. Um, and they're not able to settle down for a day or two, or they take that on their families. Um, that's, that's what I do with the, the soldiers and then the families of these folks too. And someone asked if this is being recorded. It is being recorded and we'll do our best to 
um, get it online. We've had six of these and four of them got online and the other one we gave a loaded the PowerPoint for and then another one we gave notes. So um, even when we do the exact same thing every time, I can't guarantee that it'll be there, but it is being recorded and I'll do my best to put it online. Um, then somebody else who's a first grade teacher said, I really want to learn more about letter the letters. Do you Great. do this in the air too? Um, I'm confused. She's, so she's a first grade teacher who does reading stuff with kids. And so she's asking if that, um, the thing that you were talking about with the letters is also in the air or is that on paper? It's on paper. My experience has been that the first graders are able to um, feel the letters most effectively if they're done in sand or with tracing with their fingers instead of just with a pencil. Um, it's very effective. You could do it in the air, but it's much harder because so few first graders are really able to cross the midline. So another question is how or are um, brain gym and kinesiology related to EMDR in any way? Yeah, um, great question. I've had some EMDR training. Um, EMDR is definitely related because it can open up Pandora's box. Um, and it does that in a in a similar way with, with tracking, but oftentimes the tracking is um, quick. The piece or the component that Brain Gym offers that is maybe deeper is working to reset the muscle memory of these folks, not just the visual system. The, the muscle memory of folks, the muscles actually remember the trauma in addition to the visual system. You're, you're tapping into an area called the hippocampus, as EMDR does and lazy eights do. Um, and I, I love EMDR, I think it's a wonderful technique. Uh, this incorporates more of the body and it also incorporates two other midlines. Um, there is a midline, I'm gonna stand up and show it to you that's in the center of the body here that works with the top of the brain and the bottom of the brain, i.e. the top of the body and the bottom of the body. So in Brain Gym, we have three midlines. The lateral midline, which works with the left hemisphere and the right. We have the top bottom midline that works with the top of the brain and the bottom of the brain, which is more of the cerebellum and the brainstem. And then we have a third midline that very much focuses on the postural development, which is here, and it's the front to back of the brain. See, we do evaluations of, um, let's say a student or a person who hunches over. That person is showing all kinds of physiological inhibitions because if, if the hunch over, think about what that's doing to the breathing and what that's doing to the physiology of the blood, the glucose, the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, think about the movement of someone or a student that has extraordinary stress and think about how they move. We work with the three midlines to bring balance to the body in addition to the balance of the brain. So another question is, when you worked with veterans and they have a traumatic brain injury, or yeah. did they? Did they have traumatic okay. brain injuries and did, does that respond to tracking? Absolutely, and it responds to TBIs the ones that I've worked with respond also to the postural development of helping the person to reorganize these midlines in their body as well. Definitely. All really good questions. Other thoughts or questions? Um, here's another one. Does the work with being hunched over help with older adults? Yes, um, 
I do because I'm like, I, I've had probably close to 1500 hours of training in this. And in the upper level classes, the educational kinesiology is like a, a big tree. It's an, it's a big tree that has a lot of branches of different classes that you can take. One of my favorite classes is called movement re-education. And so anytime we have posture that's humped or um, slouchy, or let me show like not able to open the, the chest so that the shoulders line up with the hips that line up with the ankles, that is just indicative of learned stress in that muscle. And the movement re-ed resets that. And I do that one-on-one. -on -one, and then I give you exercises like a physical therapist. I, I'm also very much used as a troubleshooter for PTs and OTs because I give exercises that help the physical manipulations that I might do if I saw you one-on-one -on -one, um, to keep, keep in mind the re-education of the muscles. Does that make sense? Yeah, since we're talking about being hunched over, I was going to share that another thing you were, we, you and I were talking about before everybody came on, I was talking to you about how I forget to breathe and how I've realized most people know I come from a high history of childhood trauma, a history of high childhood trauma. And so one thing I became aware of over the summer is that I don't just not breathe. I also constantly carry myself as if I'm flinched and waiting for the next thing. So I've been really working on not just breathing, but relaxing my chest and back muscles. And so you were talking to me about that exercise, then you had me go through it, that's bowing forward and then opening up again. And we did that several times. And I don't know about other people's reactions to this, but it's, I've told you before, it's near miraculous, the work that happens so quickly. And so that's one of the things that I wanted to mention here is that um, you, every time I've talked to you, you've showed me three or four things that are simple to learn that I can leave with and do on my own from then on. But we've also done work with you where I was keenly aware that it was deeply entrenched things that would need regular attention over some time. And so mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that I like about this is that there's quick things that you can take with you. And then there's also room for more in-depth work if that's needed as well. Yeah. Um, do you want to share um, the crisis experience that we had, or I could share a crisis experience? Do you do you want to do that, Denise? With Grace, you mean? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So my daughter um, is 16 and has super high anxiety and um, has also had some physical and medical issues and actually has had some medical trauma that we could trace back to when she was four. I think because of her super high anxiety, like um, for example, when she had to have her tonsils out in second grade, that was a particularly traumatic event for her that she remembers very clearly. And so from four on, there's just these interruptions of significant medical trauma. And so she was um, really to the point where she was crying all the time and feeling very uncomfortable in her body and wouldn't go to therapy. So um, I, could, I could get her to agree to go see Becky because, you know, I said it's it's a body movement thing. It's about body healing and medical stuff. And so she, at the time she could accept that. And so we went and um, she was in the middle of a pretty traumatic episode. Some things had happened and pretty much nonstop crying. And we went and saw you for an hour and um, it, it was, it's just miraculous to me. Like she was able to settle herself enough that she could move past, like it was like she was just trapped in this cycle of, I can't get out of this reaction to this trauma, even though it had been a few days at this point. And so just being able to settle yourself enough that you can, or she, that she could process some um, with you and then with me later um, so kind of settling down her amygdala so that she was able to verbally do some work and to feel more safe. I know that's one thing with her that I think is probably generational trauma stuff is just, um, you know, feeling like you're not safe to be calm or to process. 
And so what that's part of where that realization come from is because we worked with you for an hour, I think two or three times, and there were things that we could take with us from, from that moment on. But then I became very aware that there was also, you know, some, some deeper work that needed to happen to really get her to where she needed to be. So it was, it was pretty miraculous. Even my husband, who's kind of like, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we would go home and talk to him about it and we would even do some of the things with him about you know touching the back of your neck and you had us do some stuff you talked about where her some of her medical traumas had been and did some work in those particular areas and it was amazing how her system got settled down after working with you well I want to I'll share one more story and then I want to leave you with one more thing because our time is almost up so I have a, a teacher that I met in Wilkes County when I did a presentation for them. Um, and she had a daughter, she came up to me afterwards and um, spoke with me about her daughter who was a 20 year old college student. And when she came into uh, my space or to my office, she was literally on 13 different pharmaceuticals for a variety of things, um, irritable bowel syndrome, um, post-traumatic stress syndrome. She had labels all over the place. I first started to work with her a couple times a week. I try to get folks down to once a week, um, and then I wean them off. I tell them my job is to really not see you, but because this is a training period, it will be more intense at first, and then we'll wean you off of um, visits. It is a year and um, three or four months, and she's on no pharmaceuticals, none. Um, she's off of everything. Uh, now, she comes for management now, but that's a pretty typical thing that happens when I have consistency. You've got to be consistent. This is not a um, magic bullet kind of take a pill. This is all there is to it. This is a consistent process um, that requires that consistency. And if it's a child support from, from the parent, um, if it's a grown up, you're on your own, but you got me to support you. So I, I, it's all self pay. I don't take insurance. Sometimes I've been able to take insurance through some of the military stuff that I've done, but that is not typical. That is atypical because I'm not a doctor. And Becky, are you okay with me putting your, somebody's asking how to get in touch with you after this, with putting your email in the chat? Sure, sure, please. And my phone number too. You can okay. put email and phone number. Yeah. So uh, I'd, I'd like to end with, with one thing. Um, you may see or notice that people walk around and hold their foreheads sometimes. <laughs> We, we oftentimes might do this when we're trying to think or when we're feeling stress. What I'm going to invite is that you take your fingers and that you lean forward and just gently rest your forehead into your hands and just breathe. And I'm going to invite that you think about something that may not be pleasant and just reflect on how you might like to respond to that unpleasantry better. And just hold this lightly for a minute or two is what we're going to do. You may begin to feel a pulse in your forehead. And we'll just consider that that means that the circulation is getting there. And it could be a sign that you've done this for long enough, but just wanted to leave you with one more thing that may help settle you with just all that's going on in the world.
These are called your positive points. Any other questions or thoughts? We've got like two minutes and I put Becky's cell phone number and her email um, in the chat and then we will be attempting to load this recording onto the website um, when this is over. It has taken me five minutes before and it's taken me four days before. So um, just keep checking back. And there's se there's several thank yous. Becky, thank you for being thank with you us today. For thank you um, for I'll congratulate you on your first successful Zoom. Yay! Yay! And um, we appreciate you, especially that you're out of town in Atlanta, still making time to be with us. And so a lot, this is wonderful. It's very helpful. It's outstanding. So um, Becky actually was going to hopefully do maybe a session for us at our conference in the spring. So I'm yes. just keeping an eye on that because we're hoping she can be with us again. So um, this was absolutely awesome. Thank you. So cool. This was great. Or all the comments there. So um, thanks again. Hope y'all have a good rest of the day and I um, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, Denise. Thanks. Everybody uh -huh. have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Candace, I just copied everything in chat. Were you going to do that? I did it as well. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. I'm curious about the guy that she talked about. Mix somebody. I typed it in there. Peter McLean, maybe? It's in yeah. There. I Googled and found a different spelling, so I'm curious. Oh, if I just, I'm the one who wrote that. I just did it by auditory. That's, I probably typed it wrong. Well, that's what I searched for was the same way you spelled it. But then I found something neuroscientist Paul, right, Paul? I think it's Paul. McLean, M-A-C-L-E-A-N. Ah. Uh, about the triune brain. He created yes, it was Paul McLean. I, I happen to not get off yet, but. Hi, Jack. Hi there. I'm so, so glad you have... came, Jack. Well, thank you for sending that out to everybody, Denise. That's really helpful. I I've been finding myself hunching over a lot more this summer, even though I've been trying not to. So really do really do appreciate that, this meeting this. So I'm going to go join our little group before I meet some kids. So I'll right, talk to you guys good. later. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Bye. But it might All be right. worth, worth asking her. I'll send you the link. Okay.